All right. Um, maybe we'll. Ooh. Um, good evening. Maybe we'll get started. Um, thank you all for coming out. I don't know how you spent your afternoon, but if you did like me, uh, I don't know. I don't know what to say. Um, so, uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Mark Hansen, and I lead the Brown Institute here at Columbia uh, Journalism School. And uh, welcome to Pulitzer Hall, and welcome to our talk this evening. Um, the Brown Institute is a bicoastal organization housed half here at the J School and half at Stanford Engineering. And our mission is to explore the interplay between journalism and technology. And it's in the spirit of that mission that I'm happy to welcome Corey Doctorow and Jad Abumrad this evening. I'm going to introduce them both and then largely let the two of them take things over as they progress. So first off, Cory Doctorow is a science fiction novelist, blogger, and technology activist. He's the co-editor of, of the popular blog Boing Boing. Uh, he's a special consultant to the Electronic Frontier Foundation and holds an honorary doctorate in computer science from the Open University uh, in the UK, uh, where he's also a visiting professor. He's an MIT Media Lab research affiliate, and in 2007, he served as Fulbright Chair at the Annenberg Center for Public Dipl Diplomacy at USC. His talk this evening is about big tech and our current technological state in which companies like Google, Facebook, Apple, and Twitter are treated almost as constitutional monarchies, um, acknowledged as, as he puts it, rightful rulers of the net, and then subjected to regulations. He'll propose an alternative future, a democratic future based on what he calls the way of the hacker. Next, uh, you, will, um, you will meet Jad Abumrad. He's the creator and co-host of one of Public Radio's most popular shows today, Radiolab. Uh, the program won the George Foster Peabody Award and explores big questions in science, philosophy, and mankind. Radiolab podcasts are downloaded over 5 million times each month, and the program is carried on more than 500 stations across the U.S. and internationally. In 2011, Abumrad was honored as a MacArthur genius. Um, so we're pleased to have both uh, Corey and uh, Jad here this evening. And I'm going to basically turn things over to, to Corey to start. Let, uh, please join me in welcoming him. Hi, folks. Thank you all uh, for coming tonight. And thank you to Columbia for hosting me. This is my, the final event of the week. Uh, and some of you I see have uh, I've seen it. All of them, some of you I'm seeing tonight for the first time. I've, I've felt very warmly welcome here at Columbia. It's, uh, it's wonderful. And especially as someone who grew up in, to Tor in Toronto, coming to New York is always exciting. There's this old joke that it takes two, two Torontonians to change a light bulb, one to change it, and one go to, to go to New York and make sure that light bulbs are still cool. And uh, <laughs> I, I feel, uh, I always feel happy to be here. Um, so I want to uh, start by talking a little about um, compatibility by way of sort of setting up the theme tonight. So compatibility, the idea that you can just plug one thing into another, it's the source of just lots and lots of goodness in our world. Uh, you know, it's not just the fact that you can plug all of your appliances into any of the plugs in your house or screw any light bulb into uh, any light socket. I mean, m you know, much more, um, uh, much more impressively, I think, for us, and something that's arisen during our lifespan is uh, the web, right? The idea that anyone can make browsers, anyone can put up a server, anyone can write a page, and that they all just s work together. They don't always work together perfectly, but they work. Um, compatibility gets us all kinds of stuff that um, makes our, our days better and our lives better, uh, whether that's being able to um, uh, take the cigarette lighter that came with your car and when tobacco goes out of fashion to stick a USB phone charger in it, or whether it's being able to break free of the monopoly power of Microsoft by firing up Google Docs and opening a document prepared with their proprietary software in an in a, uh, alternative to it. So now I want to talk a little about uh, a different kind of compatibility. Uh, the, the most important and maybe the worst understood kind of compatibility, uh, which is adversarial interoperability. So it's natural when you invent a thing, whether that's the web or the office document format or a cigarette lighter in a car, to think of it as a product, right? I made it, I finished it, it's done, go use it. Um, but later, people come along and they think of your finished product as a part that goes into another product. That cigarette lighter is actually unfinished. What it needs is a USB charger. 
uh, you know, the, and this, the, what, what happens uh, regularly and monotonically is things that are big and impressive and have a lot of investment capital and that people uh, crave and that they line up for long hours at Toys R Us to buy, although not anymore, obviously, uh, become things that are just uh, reduced to an app that runs in a browser, right? So, you know, when, when I was a lad, we would line up at Toys R Us to buy games consoles, and those games consoles have become tiny scripts that run in browser windows now. And so it's common for inventors to feel vindicated when they take the products that other people made and use them as parts and make new inventions. But it's also common for the inventors whose inventions they're working with to feel resentful about this, to, to feel like uh, it is illegitimate to have taken the fruit of their labor and treated it as, as a mere part to be combined with other parts. As they say, every pirate dreams of being an admiral. Uh, which is why we need not just compatibility, but adversarial interoperability. The ability to turn a product into a part without permission, and even against the will of the person who made that product. Uh, and this is a very common thing in computing, um, because computers have this like almost mystical property that um, is, again, not widely understood outside of computer science, and that um, was a revelation when it arrived and has now become almost a nuisance. And that's this idea of what's, what's called Turing completeness. So before Alan Turing and the modern computer, uh, when you wanted to build a, a computer to solve a problem, you built a computer that could just solve that problem. If you wanted to calculate a ballistic table, you made a ballistic calculating table calculating engine. And if you wanted to solve the census, you made a thing that could solve the census. And if you wanted to calculate the actuarial table for an insurance company, you built that computer. And if you wanted to solve a different kind of problem, maybe you could tear that old computer apart for parts, but you couldn't get that computer to compute the new kind of problem. And then along comes Alan Turing and working with people like uh, von Neumann and the Hungarians at the Princeton Institute. They invent this architecture for computing that we use today that we call Turing completeness that is a, a, a model for computing whereby you design a machine that can execute all the programs we can, uh, we can express symbolically. So every computer that we have in the world now, the little system on a chip in your inkjet cartridge, uh, the digital fart machine you bought for 99 cents in a, in a, a, a dollar store, um, the uh, phone in your pocket, the laptop on your desk, the servers in a, in a cloud farm, all of these computers can run all the same programs. In fact, all the computers since the first Turing Complete computer can run all the same programs. Now, some of them are much more powerful than others. The computer in a singing greeting card might take a thousand years to execute a program that can be run on the computer in your phone, but given enough time, we can do it. So when this occurred, it was a revelation, and it remains uh, an amazing thing because it means that if you uh, sink some money into improving a computer for a singing greeting card or a 99-cent fart machine, whatever improvements that you make also benefit things like seismic dampers and insulin pumps because they all use the same computing architecture. Uh, but it's also turned into a problem because it would be great if we could make computers that could, were almost Turing complete like a computer that could run all programs except for the ones that are really terrible and make us angry or upset or endanger our lives. Like it would be great if you could make printers that could only print and not run malicious software that they get infected with and scan all of your printed documents with to find credit card numbers and send to the hacker who infected your printer. That would be an awesome thing. It turns out that we, we don't know how to make that. In fact, it turns out that like even computers that are sort of capable, or programming languages that are sort of capable and seem like they only do two or three things, can be intelligently recombined until they become Turing complete. It's actually kind of a, a fixture at hacker conventions. You'll have someone who'll, who'll show up and they'll go like, do you all remember last year when someone launched another social network and they, uh, they decided that the people who signed up, they could decorate their home pages with little glittery unicorn gifts. And then they made a little scripting language that would let you make the unicorn dance across the page. And it could go forward and back and up and down. It had like five instructions. Yeah, I figured out how to, write a, uh, uh, how to make that Turing complete by recombining those four instructions. And uh, then I wrote a full-blown programming environment in it. And now I've infected all of the home pages in the entire social network with a virus. Right? That happens all the time. Turing completeness is really hard to get away from. But the upside of Turing completeness when we're talking about adversarial compatibility is that figuring out how a program runs and writing another program that talks to it, super easy, right? So it just turns out not to be uh, that hard to write a program that can interoperate with the programs on an iPhone or a printer cartridge or, an in or uh, uh, um, 
the uh, insulin pump in a closed loop uh, pancreatic, uh, artificial pancreas um, or, or any of the other devices that we use in our world. And so even though the people who make these things might want to freeze out competitors or might want to assert the primacy of their invention against being turned into a part by some upstart, it's really hard for them to manifest their will, right? It's just not that hard to reverse engineer the program they wrote and, and write another program. And this was, for the longest time, just the most common story in tech. You know, IBM comes along, they invent mainframes, they create the market for them, they put them all over America, they have this super lucrative business, and um, their competitors come along and they start to scout the places where IBM is making all their money. Like maybe they're selling software, so they make software that can run on IBM mainframes. Or maybe they're selling terminals and printers, so they make terminals and printers that trick the IBM mainframes into thinking they're IBM terminals and printers, and they sell them for half of what IBM is selling them for. And over and over again until like IBM and or one of its competitors invents the mini computer or the personal computer. And you know, the companies, it's not like they go gently into the good night, right? IBM is furious about this. They take all kinds of countermeasures to stop adversarial interoperability, and then they always lose because Turing completeness turns out to be a kind of latent law of the universe that we can't get away from, and writing com programs that talk to other programs is just not that hard. So what this means, uh, a world of adversarial interoperability, especially com computational adversarial interoperability, is a world in which becoming a successful dominant company just makes you this big fat reservoir of nutrients that like more nimble companies can come in and like suck you dry of and use to start their own businesses. You found a market, you found some customers, you found a profitable way to do something, and along come all of your competitors to do it for less money than you're doing it for. And then they swell into giant bloated uh, sacks of nutrients that new competitors come along and do this too. Uh, and that was the cycle for the longest time until Ronald Reagan. So Ronald Reagan had a lot of weird ideas. One of them was that the University of Chicago economists should be listened to. And the University of Chicago economists, they had a lot of weird ideas, one of which was that we shouldn't enforce antitrust laws uh, except when uh, an industry is um, uh, cooking the books so that uh, they set a minimum price for products and that everything else like buying all of your competitors or taking anti-competitive action to stop adversarial interoperability or setting a maximum price, you know, predatorily pricing something to force all the competition out of the market, um, that um, any of those things uh, uh, would be a um, uh, would not be a suitable uh, rubric for enforcing antitrust law, and it's only when you had price fixing for for a um, minimum price that antitrust should come along. And um, tech was born in the Reagan era, right? Apple II Plus comes out like 1978. Reagan is elected in 1979, takes office in 1980. And so, although tech, like the people who started tech, were no more and no less flawed than the people involved in all the other industries. That wasn't like tech attracted would-be monopolists. They were just the first people who arrived on the scene when nobody was smacking monopolists for being monopolistic. So whenever they stumbled on a monopolistic impulse, that impulse was able to bear fruit. And moreover, you know, the lawyers that they hired, they weren't lawyers who had like the visceral experience of being destroyed by antitrust regulators. It's a very unpleasant experience. They, they were like hiring their buddies straight out of Stanford Law. And to the extent that their buddies remembered their antitrust uh, law and, and, and started to counsel their clients not to, not to get up to monopolistic shenanigans, um, they, they stopped after the Microsoft antitrust case where you had a dominant player with 95% of the operating system market and the US government just declined to do anything about it. The lesson that the lawyers took away from that was like, go wild, kids. And so with, with you know, these young lawyers with uh, no shackles on their intuition about, um, about how mono monopolistic you could be and these tech entrepreneurs, what you ended up with was this extremely uh, uh, monopoly hungry industry. And so they had adversarial, uh, the blocking adversarial, inter or rather they had uh, adversarial interoperability against the people who'd come before was a kind of sword for them. They could take the giants of yesteryear like Microsoft or like IBM and they could slay them with adversarial interoperability. They, the Microsoft could make operating systems that disrupted IBM. Um, and then their shield was the lack of antitrust enforcement, that having conquered IBM, they could then do a bunch of stuff that IBM was too gun shy to even try to stop anyone doing to them what they did to IBM. So they could interrupt this cycle. Uh, and you see this over and over again. Um, Apple 
uh, did this to uh, Microsoft, right? They, they cloned all of the Microsoft Office apps in order to break up Microsoft's monopoly and bring customers over to them. And they created Pages and they created uh, Keynote and so on. But as soon as you arrived at Apple, they locked you in with uh, things like app stores um, that uh, limit whose software you can run and, and particularly limit you from running software that might disrupt their monopoly on, uh, on audio and audiovisual works. Um, and you had it with um, Facebook, right? Facebook kicks off. And the first thing they do is they try to steal customers from MySpace. And the way that they do it is they give people a tool that will log into MySpace on their behalf and grab all the MySpace messages waiting for them and upload them to their Facebook inbox and let them reply on Facebook and then go and post them back to MySpace with you know, a little footer at the bottom that says, this was sent from Facebook, why are you still on MySpace? Right? And so it let people keep a foot in both worlds. Um, and uh, as this was all going on, as these companies were using uh, adversarial interoperability to like steal the lunch of the people who'd come before them, they were also sharpening anti-competitive tools that would stop people from doing this to them later. They, they were the pirates preparing to become admirals. And, in, and two of the tools that they used for this, one was uh, Section 121 of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act that makes it a felony to bypass uh, a copyright protection. Uh, and so um, once you have software in something, it has copyright in it. And so anything that you use to block adversarial interoperability uh, violates the statute. So like you make an iPhone and you lock it so it only uses one software store. And then anything you do to bypass that lock and install a second software store that might uh, give the people who wrote the software a better deal, charge them a smaller commission or whatever, or give the people who want to use the software more software that they're happy with, whether that's um, people in China who want to use uh, privacy software that the state can't spy on, or people in America who want to use um, software that tells them every time a drone strike kills someone in Yemen, which is a thing that Apple repeatedly blocked from the App Store. Um, it, you can't do that because you have to bypass this copyright lock to do it. So the copyright locks and, and Section 12 of the DMCA became a major feature of blocking interoperability for devices. And then for services, a law called the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act became the, the tool of choice, the CFAA. It's a, a law with an improbably checkered history. After Ronald Reagan was terrified by the Matthew Broderick movie War Games, uh, he set out to create an anti-hacking law. Uh, Congress wanted to uh, future-proof their anti-hacking law and, and not have it become obviated by changes in technology. And so they wrote this super broad anti-hacking law that makes it a felony to exceed your authorization on a computer that doesn't belong to you. Well, what the tech industry figured out is that if you put 40,000 words of boilerplate in behind an I agree button uh, on a service, that that would define the authorization that you extended to the user and that anything they did to, that violated that 40,000 words of, of um, boilerplate was an offense under the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, which is how after Facebook successfully puts MySpace out of business by writing bots to log into MySpace and bring stuff into Facebook, they then successfully sue Power Ventures, who make a tool that logs into Facebook and puts the, your Facebook messages in a Power Ventures window. So um, tech was the first, but they weren't the last. Every industry learned how to follow this pattern. They, they followed the the path that tech took. Uh, lots of things led to industry concentration, but this sure didn't help. Uh, we, we are in a world now where every industry can avail itself of a little bit of software. And once you add a little bit of software, you can avail yourself of the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act and uh, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. And so you have everything from medical implant vendors to voting machine vendors citing these laws in order to stop competitors from making interoperable products. So now I want to talk a little about big tech, right? This is how we got to big tech. This is how tech got as big as it did. Um, now I have a friend who uh, a couple of years ago went to work for Facebook at a very senior position. And before he, he went to the company, we went out for like a last supper. And, uh, and I s predicted that he wouldn't enjoy it very much. And he just quit. And he, we saw each other recently. And he said, you know, I didn't enjoy it very much. And I said, I'm not surprised. And he said, but I took heart. Because the one thing I learned working at Facebook is that they're idiots just like you and me. They're not supervillains. And he's right. You know, Facebook is not made up of supervillains. They're made up of fallible humans just like you and me. Uh, I'm no better than they are. I may be worse than they are. But the problem of Facebook is not that the people who work at it are fallible. There will, there will always be fallible people at the helm of every firm. The problem is that Facebook has used 
these anti-competitive tools to lock in two billion people so that conducting their daily rounds, right, their communication, their employment, their social lives, their political organizing, is subject to, de to the decisions of a fallible group of people. And there is no one in the world infallible enough to be put in charge of the daily lives of two billion people. Now, um, the big tech companies are now being subject to calls for regulation. Uh, and that is not a terrible idea, but the, the devil is in the details. Uh, big industries, their first uh, preference is always to not be regulated at all. But their second preference is to be regulated like crazy, but in a way that uh, only incumbents can afford to comply with and that new entrants into the market can't. You know, one of the ways that the big tech companies have gotten as big as they have is by buying every competitor they couldn't crush. And you know, this is playing out with Facebook this week as the um, uh, founders of Instagram leave Facebook and you know, the founders of WhatsApp are giving interviews to Forbes where they say, I left Facebook because I hated it there and they, were, and, you know, they weren't terrible people but it's a terrible company. And, and you know, th this like, motif you know, is, is, is uh, in the news today and I'm sure that Facebook, given its druthers, would have just preferred that rather than those, those people being able to start businesses that they then had to go out and buy, that they would have had to come to Facebook hat in hand to get a job at Facebook to execute their ideas because starting a business because of the compliance burden of the regulation was so difficult that only the incumbents could, could be involved in starting a business. Um, and uh, we're, we're seeing that uh, in action right now. So. Um, uh, this year, Congress passed SESTA and FOSTA. These are the uh, notional anti-sex trafficking rules that give companies an affirmative duty to police all the messages on their platforms to make sure that um, no one is using them to uh, buy or sell sex. Uh, however you feel about sex trafficking, it's a very expensive proposition, and there aren't many companies that can afford to undertake it, uh, and they're all the existing winners. So while, like, they would prefer not to have to spend the tens or hundreds of millions of dollars involved in this or forgo the revenue for having message boards where that kind of thing pl takes place. Um, as between that and having to buy or crush the next Instagram because the next Instagram couldn't get off the ground because they couldn't afford this filtering regime, they'll take, they'll take the rules, they'll take the regulation. Um, uh, you know, we're seeing lots and lots of calls for the platforms to regulate the legitimate, no fooling, serious problem of harassing and hate speech that they have, which is an actual, real problem that we are really uh, need to do something about. But all the solutions that are being proposed are unbelievably expensive. Hire an army of moderators, write a, a, an elaborate AI system, and then hire an army of human checkers to override the mistakes that it makes. And again, this is the kind of thing that at, 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 uh, if, they, if they could, they'd rather not have that duty. But if they have that duty, as permanent internet domination licenses go, it's kind of a bargain. Uh, and then in the European Union, they've just enacted this rule, uh, well, they're on the way to enacting this rule, Article 13 of the new Copyright Directive that says that if you offer a place where the public can communicate to the public, where anything can be posted for public consumption, you have a duty to assemble a database of every known copyrighted work. And the way that you assemble that database is by allowing anyone in the world to upload anything into the database and say, this is my copyright. And there are no penalties for those people lying and claiming copyright over works they don't own. And if a user posts something, and it looks like something in the database, it's an exact or a similar match to anything in the database, you have to block it. Right? So this is hundreds of millions of dollars worth of copyright filters. Uh, one of the things that we've learned from these kinds of filters is it probably won't be very good at stopping copyright infringement. You know, the Chinese uh, state filters that block uh, subversive images are pretty easy to subvert. Uh, the, um, there was a, a paper being presented next month in Toronto at the ACM Security Conference on subverting the hate speech filters. It turns out that the best hate speech filters we have can be subverted by adding the word love to a message. You can take the most hateful message and add the word love to it, and it just sails through the filter. So they won't be that hard for people who are playing an iterated game, like de dedicated copyright infringers who spend all their day trying to figure out how to get past these filters. It won't be hard for them to defeat, but it will be super hard 
for someone who just posts something that is not infringing, that is accidentally identified as infringing, to get around because your job isn't to learn the abstruse rules of copyright filters. Your job is to try and post you know, your kid's birthday party or um, that message about your mom's memorial next week that has been blocked because the Sears portrait you put with it looks too much like a Sears portrait that someone's claimed a copyright in. So let's talk about automation. Automation is obviously a big part of the big tech story. Um, we are now in a world in which systems that used to be superhuman intensive are being uh, replaced with code that scales in a way that human labor can't. Um, and these algorithmic systems are, uh, have an incredibly uh, important and uh, urgent role that they play in our lives. Um, you have things like predictive policing algorithms that determine where the police go and who they stop and whose car they look inside of and whose pockets they turn out. You have automated sentencing tools that decide who gets bail and who goes free or how long you go to jail for. Um, you have uh, automated lending tools that decide who gets credit and who doesn't. You have these filtering tools that decides who speaks and who doesn't. And one of the consequences of uh, the uh, rise of tools that block adversarial interoperability is that they also block independent scrutiny and thus criticism and understanding of these systems. Because if you want to figure out whether or not Facebook is still doing what they claim they stopped doing, which is advertising worse financial products to black people than to white people, which is a thing they got caught doing, promised they wouldn't do anymore, and which is radioactively illegal in America, the only way you can do that, apart from taking Facebook's word for it, is to make a bunch of Facebook identities up, some of which are black and some of which are white, but that uh, are otherwise the same, and then see which ads you get. Well, Facebook's terms of service prohibit that, and the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act makes a felony out of violating Facebook's terms of service. So if we want to subject, the, subject these things to independent scrutiny, if you want to be able to take apart an iPhone and decompile its software and find out whether the camera is being covertly operated or the microphone is being covertly operated or whether data is being exfiltrated, then you need to be able to bypass a copyright lock. Well, that violates Section 1201 of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. And in this country, you know, in the early years of the DMCA, we had security researchers being dragged off stage at technical conferences by the FBI for giving presentations. Right? And we don't get that anymore, mostly because security researchers don't present that kind of work anymore. What we get instead is that these defects fester in devices until they're so widely exploited that they can no longer be denied. And so the last person to know that you shouldn't be trusting that gadget, whether it's your voting machine, the automation system in your car, the seismic damper that keeps your building from falling down, the artificial pancreas that keeps you alive, the only thing that the last person to know that it's not trustworthy is you. Right? The criminals know it doesn't work. Uh, the government knows it doesn't work because they're hiring people to write exploits for it because they want to attack their adversaries. Uh, the um, the uh, people who made it understand its defects better than anyone. It's just the poor suckers who are buying it and relying on it that don't get to find out about it. And you know, I, I think that there's a good case to be made that these uses of these laws are unconstitutional. And in fact, there is litigation underway to challenge the constitutionality of these rules. So the ACLU and, the and uh, First Look, who published The Intercept, have brought a case over the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. They want to create synthetic Facebook identities and find out whether Facebook practices racial discrimination. Um, we at Electronic Frontier Foundation, a nonprofit that I work for, uh, we've brought a, a suit on behalf of an academic at Johns Hopkins and another academic at MIT uh, to challenge the constitutionality of Section 121 of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act so that we can bypass copyright locks for purposes that don't infringe copyright. Um, and the, without these challenges, without the ability to adversarially interoperate with these systems, we end up having to put so much trust in these systems and they have to therefore be perfect. And if they're anything less than perfect, they will fail very badly. They become very brittle. And we know that these systems are not perfect, right? The systems have really serious problems, as I said, with hate speech and harassment, bad advertising, malware, and so on. And people have a lot of ideas for fixing this. There are good ideas and there are bad ideas. Um, and if we address ourselves to the tech industry and its problems by addressing its bigness rather than the fact that it's tech, we can open a space where those people can all try all of their ideas for how to fix it. If we say to the companies, not you have a duty 
to police all of these bad activities on your platform, and therefore you also uh, need to stop anyone from doing anything with your platform that you don't approve of because they might be subverting your duty. And if instead we say, we are stripping you of the right to stop other people from figuring out how your platform works and adding overlays to it that improve it, then um, we, can, we can create a system in which individuals, groups of individuals, companies, uh, government agencies and a whole cluster of entities can uh, work to ameliorate these systems, can try the good ideas and the bad ideas. The ideas that are good for a small number of people but not good enough for everyone that the big companies would ever take them on. Um, what's happened since Reagan is not the spread of technology. Obviously since 1980 we've had a lot of technology, but what's much more salient about the world that we live in today is it's the spread of monopoly. And as you heard at the start of this talk, um, what's happening instead of creating a democratic technology where we all get to interoperate with these tools in ways that we want or choose whose interoperable tools we use, is the creation of a kind of constitutional monarchy. So in a constitutional monarchy, you div acknowledge first that the kings have the divine right to rule, but then an aristocracy forms that puts a limit on how that right is exercised. That says to the kings, you must and must not do these certain things. You have these duties to create these public policy outcomes that we as aristocrats think of as important. And that aristocracy in an age of a highly concentrated industry are the alumna of those industries who go into regulation. Right? It's not a coincidence that every chairman of the FCC for the last several administrations is a former telecoms executive. Because when you have four or five big telcos, the only people qualified to regulate them have worked not usually at one of those companies, but at like three of them. And the one that they haven't worked at, they're married to someone who works at them, right? And so what you end up with is this rotating door that's not just driven by corruption, but by necessity. Because the only people who understand the workings of these concentrated industries are the people who are in these industries. And you know, if you think Mark Zuckerberg is unfit to regulate the lives of two billion people today, Imagine how glaring that unfitness will be after a decade with no competition when the only people putting checks on his power are people who used to work at Facebook or a company like Facebook. So everyone benefits from the ability to make decisions about how our technology works, not just technologists. Um, it, is, it is great to be able to tweak the tools that you use directly to reach into them, but if you can't, it's great to be able to decide whose tweaks you're going to trust, to be able to cast around the world for people who have priorities like yours and, and choose their fixes instead of the fixes that a big company made up because we're idiosyncratic and our use cases are idiosyncratic. Moving the decision making closer to users, especially vulnerable people and uh, people from minorities presented, uh, rep poorly represented in big tech is a, is a benefit. And it's a benefit over and above the benefits that we get from doing the laudable work of making big tech get more diverse. By all means, let's make Silicon Valley hire more brown people and more women. But at the same time, let's just let brown people and women and all the other people who don't work in Silicon Valley these days start their own thing, whether that's a co-op or a business or, or something else, and make the tech that comes out of big tech work for them in ways that suit them. Let's not deputize big tech to police sprawling complex social, this co sprawling, uh, s complex social problems that they're causing because that puts a floor under how small we can make big tech. Right? Once we say that big tech has a duty to spend X hundred million dollars a year to solve the problems that they're causing, we also say we can't make big tech so small that they don't have several hundred million dollars a year hanging around to solve those problems. As undemocratic as it is for a bunch of Silicon Valley tech bros to make code decisions that affect, adversely affect the lives of billions of people, it's even more undemocratic to shift things around so that only their venal bosses get to make those decisions. The most democratic answer is for us to seize the means of computation, to create technical democracies where we get to choose to do it ourselves or choose who does it for us. Technology is not intrinsically corrupt. Creating a structure and a temptation to behave monopolistically produces monopolies. Uh, lax antitrust is a moral hazard. It tempts the normal flawed people who are no better or worse than you and me into corrupt practices. Uh, not realizing the impossi impossibility of doing right for billions of users does not make you a supervillain. It just makes you a normal person with normal self-deceptive hubris. Corruption doesn't come from the evil in our souls. 
but from the structures that make it easier than it is to be wicked than it is to be virtuous. So technological utopianism, this is the end here, is not the belief that technology will automatically make our lives better, but rather that uh, technology wielded right can forestall the problems of technology wielded wrong. That uh, we, it's not just the hope for technology's liberating potential, it's that hope posed against the terror of what happens if technology's liberating potential is uh, not realized. Uh, technology is not the most important issue we have in our world. As we're reminded every day, issues about climate and gender and inequality and race and a thousand other things are far more important than technology. But technology, the internet, the nervous system of the 21st century, that's the battlefield on which those fights will be won or lost. Technology is not the most important fight, but it's the most foundational. If we don't have the free, fair, and open infrastructure in, on which that fight can be waged, then we lose it before we start. Thank you. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, I, so here's, here's, here's my plan. I'd like you to join me in that plan. I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. Yeah. So provocative, what you just said. Uh, I'll ask three or four, use that time to ruminate, reflect on what questions you have, and then I'll throw it to you guys, and then we'll see what happens. Um, so I found myself uh, during that talk thinking a lot about, um, I mean, it's interesting, sort of what, what you were talking about, like sort of uh, big tech, reminded me a lot of the sort of the conversation that was happening in the wake of the bailout, financial mm -hmm. bailout, when um, I think it was Matt Taibbi who said, if a company is too big to fail, the solution is to make them small enough where they can fail, right? Yeah. So uh, how do we do that? Is that a top-down? Uh, at what level do we engage that? Uh, is that, is that a, a series of individual punk rock hacker types who are, who are attacking the tech in the manner that Facebook did to MySpace? Or is it something that has to happen top-down? So uh, I think that we can cleave the problem into two pieces. One are the things that we... Uh, can do structurally that are like direct interventions, and what are the things that we can do that create the space for uh, individual interventions to solve the parts of the problem who's, that aren't obvious, but you know, the, to clear the obstacles to solving the problem. So structurally, for example, we could just make them pay their taxes. Right? Like, it's not just that that's an injustice that I pay taxes and they don't. It's also a problem because if I start a business and I don't have uh, the surplus capital to do the financial engineering to avoid paying my taxes, then I operate at a disadvantage, right? And so this, this creates a kind of moat around their business in the form of greater retained earnings through the fiction that all of their money is sitting somewhere in the Irish Sea, right? Uh, and um, so that's a, that's a good structural intervention. Um, we could uh, revive antitrust law. We could make them sell off their, um, their uh, uh, competitors that they bought and diversify their business units and, and uh, break them up in that way. Uh, but we can also clear the obstacles to competing with them by uh, reforming the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, reforming the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, and that would allow them to be like nibbled to death, maybe by punk rock hackers, and maybe by like people funded by venture capitalists, right? Like it, you know, I don't think that um, people invest in Google because they are invested in the uh, number of private airplanes that Google management gets to buy. Right? They invest in Google because they think that there's an upside to investing in Google, right? And if there's an upside in investing in Google's competitor, there will be people who will invest in that too, including people who are currently invested in Google who might sell their stake in Google and invest in a competitor of theirs. And so it's, you know, markets don't solve all of our problems, but they're actually not bad at like breaking up big and efficient firms, provided that the markets are well regulated uh, and that there are um, people who uh, who have cool ideas that might be able to to attack them. Gotcha. And uh, I, I'm curious, where do you where do you where do you, where are you inspired? So uh, I mean, the, the the idea that you started your talk with, which was that what we've got to get to is this. What was the phrase? Adversarial. Adversarial interoperability. There's so many syllables in that. Yeah, I know. Um, it, we've got to get to this sort of uh, way of operating where we can take the product of somebody else and make it a part that we use to make our own products, sometimes in an advers adversarial way. So where do you see that happening that, that you find inspiring? So, I mean, that's the world that I grew up in, and it was, like, it was like the water that I swam in until pretty recently. In fact, it was the water that we all swam in until pretty recently. You know, um, 
Like, I remember being really excited the day that Google figured out how to scrape all of the web pages on the internet and make a really good search engine. That's adversarial interoperability, right? That was like, you know, the, the, the day I stopped using AltaVista and started using Google was a great day in my technological uh, progression, right? The, the day that I was able to fire up an emulator and run the programs that I'd written for my Apple II Plus on my Mac was like a great day, right? That adversarial interoperability was all uh, very exciting for me. And drip by drip, it went away. Uh, and so, you know, there's like this risk of nostalgia and like kind of lapsarianism. Oh, things were much better when I was younger and, you know, my back didn't hurt so much and I, I, could, I, I didn't need verifocal glasses and so on. But I really do think we're, we're losing something important here. Do um, you see, I mean, are, is there anything that you're seeing bubbling up now? Because I think, okay, so Facebook as this like gigantic company that we're all a part of, uh, uh, do you see anyone doing to Facebook what Facebook did to MySpace? No, because when they tried, when Power Ventures tried, they got shut down by Facebook because Facebook managed to get better lawyers than MySpace could and invoke the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. Like what had happened between MySpace and Power Ventures was a bunch of decisions that had eroded the, the protections around the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act and made it more and more about, about end user license agreements. Uh, and making those end user license agreements into uh, uh, an enforceable form of private law. I mean, really what we've seen in the last like 20 years is the rise of a new, of a new offense that we could call felony contempt of business model, right? And we are like, you know, with the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act and with the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, we're like one vision system away from a toaster that won't toast unauthorized bread, right? And it's hilarious, but then ask yourself, if Apple gets to tell you whose software you run on your phone, why shouldn't KitchenAid tell you whose bread you put in your toaster? We can make all kinds of arguments about safety. People start fires with their toasters, right? They could have a better quality toasting experience if they only used bread that was engineered specifically to work with their toaster. I mean, why shouldn't your dishwasher only wash authorized dishes? Foodborne illnesses are killers. How could anyone be expected to make a dishwasher that could get all of the dishes so clean that they could guarantee that your family wouldn't die of a horrible pathogen unless they could tell you what kind of dishes to use. Oh my God. Right? How do you sleep, man? Yeah. <laughs> I, you know, so there's this quote, if you've ever done like first year uh, property law, like there's this quote from Blackstone from the 18th century that property is that which man enjoys sole and despotic domain over to the exclusion of all other people in the universe. And, uh, you know, that there's always been a, like easements in your property rights, but not like today, yeah. right? Yeah. You know, the... If I sell you like a book, I don't get to tell you which chair to sit in when you read it. But if I sell you an ebook, I get to tell you which screen it's allowed to run on. That's crazy, right? And it's done in the name of copyright, which is supposed to be about uh, you know preserving the culture industry. But the cultural freight of books is much older than copyright. You know the the the. You, if you go into like medieval libraries, you find these things in the hand copied Bibles and the hand copied texts that say, uh, don't steal this book, only a jerk steals a book. Make a copy of it instead, right? Be a, be like do what I did, get a scribe and make a copy of this book, right? Like that's the normative deal we've had around books for a lot longer than we've had, on co than we've had copyright. Gotcha. Anyone have any questions to throw to you guys? If you do, uh, do you, if I can coax you to yeah. come to the mic there. And if we could um, start with a question from someone who identifies as a woman or non-binary and then move to someone who identifies as a male or non-binary. And we'll you know, line up at the mics in either order, but we'll call on you that way. So if you just make your ways to the mics. Hello. Hi. Thanks for Hi. coming. Hi. Thank you. Very interesting. Um, a lot of the language that you use throughout uh, your discussion reminded me of a piece written by uh, John Perry Barlow. You probably are familiar with it, the Declaration it's of Independence, Independence of Cyberspace. Cyberspace. Yeah, it's a it's a it's an interesting piece. It was written in 1996 after the Telecommunications Reform Act, um, and I wanted to ask you sort of your perspective of the shift of the kind of audience of that of that philosophical piece and also kind of to speak more towards the mechanics behind that and um, yeah, to talk a little bit more yeah. about that 
in relationship to where we find ourselves now? Yeah, you know, um, so Barlow was a friend and mentor of mine. He died this year. Uh, and uh, he, um, I think that the thing that we misunderstand most about Barlow and his colleagues who were involved in the early days of kind of the digital rights movement is because of their bravado, and Barlow had lots of it, we think of them as triumphalists. We think that like Barlow just thought that automatically technology would make us free. But I knew Barlow and he was terrified of what would happen if we got technology policy wrong. Like the declaration is not a statement about the inevitability of the triumph of good code over bad law. It's a call to arms to make good code to address bad law. And if there's been a maturation, and I hope there's been at least a little one since Barlow's time, it's that there were a lot of people back then who I think really sincerely believed that maybe we could obviate bad, bad law with good code, right? Maybe like if you had cryptography that could keep perfect secrets, maybe like state coercion would just stop being so important. We could have like a non-coercive, uh, uh, state, you know, because, because they just couldn't make you give up your secrets. But what I think we've learned since then is that um, in the world of, say, security and cryptography, uh, to defend yourself s successfully, you have to make no mistakes. And to be successfully attacked, your adversary has to find one mistake you've made. And if you're just a person who's trying to live your life while, say, fomenting dissident ideology in a autocracy and you're trying to like feed your kids but you're also trying to do the political work, you don't have the mental or technical capacity to be perfect all the time. And if you're someone working for the state as a contractor or staff in a domestic surveillance apparatus, like your whole day's work is finding the one mistake that the dissident has made. And so Code can't create enduring structures that pose an alternative to autocratic illegitimate states. But what code has been useful for and continues to be useful for, what I think Barlow saw could be useful for, is to open a space in which activity that was otherwise fraught or suppressed could take place long enough to foment change that would create the legitimate responsive state that would otherwise, um, that, that, that would mean that we wouldn't need the cryptography to keep the secrets anymore, that would detract from the urgency of it, right? That would make them stop hiring people to spy on everyone, right? The, the, uh, a state that was responsive to the citizenry. And one of the things that I worry about when in the, the other crypto and cryptocurrency is that so much of that rhetoric is about weakening states. And you hear them talk about things like, God, have you heard that governments want to ban working cryptography? How the hell will we make our um, browsers secure enough to handle millions of dollars in cryptocurrency transactions if they're going to ban working cryptography? And at the same time, they say, also, with our working cryptocurrency, we can make it so no one ever pays taxes again, and the states will uh, become much weaker. Well, weak states don't stop exercising power. They just exercise power on behalf of the powerful, right? They, become less res they don't become less powerful. They become less responsive. And so what they're doing is creating the situation in which all the things that they worry about states doing, all the oppressive activities they worry about from states, become inevitable because they're starving the state of the resource that it needs to do good. Now, a state with a lot of resources won't always do good, but a state with no resources can't do good. Yes, sir. My name is Antonio. I'm a student at New York University. And my question, I wanted to bring up the example of Uber as a company that operates in the tech world and they argue to death that they only operate, that they're a technology company, not a yeah. service provider. And so when a company operates in the physical space, would you say that, com that companies that do have a different set of rules and is it, w what do those set of rules, where, did, where does the intermingling of yeah. those rules come in because Uber can 
can't and shouldn't, for instance, deny uh, rights to people who are blind and use guide dogs, and they do all the time. Yeah. I have friends who, who do that. But because they're so hard to reach, and, 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 and when they call, they offer apologies, but no real solutions, no, no acceptable solution to a blind person that, that uh, was denied service. That my question is in regards to companies that operate in the, the physical space, are they more yeah. or less, um, in, in, more, in, in more, more or less having to follow more rules? So I think you hit on a whole bunch of really important points there. So one is whether there's like even a meaningful distinction between a tech industry and a not tech industry. I think that that distinction, you know, that ship sailed, right? For lots of reasons. Like one is like because software is the universal machine because it can run all the programs, then we're just adding software to everything. So everything is becoming a tech company, right? Uh, because software becomes a piece of the automation story. Uh, there's also um, the fact that in a world of increased wealth concentration, the institutional investors for all of these companies are literally the same people, right? So we talk about big tech and big content, say, when we talk about copyright battles. And you look at like the, the, the cap tables for these companies, they're not different companies, right? Like they're just, you know, interlocking boards, interlocking major investors, interlocking institutional investors. In a world with a ton of index funds, it's, it's like it's always the same people because it's just, you know, the same five giant index funds that own the largest plurality of the shares of every major company in the world. So they're not even different companies in that sense. So in, in some really important sense that like tech companies and not tech companies are the same companies. Um, and then, you know, are tech companies ever not physical? No, right? The, all tech companies extrude into the world in some way. That's, that's why tech is salient, because it extrudes into the world in some way, either by, you know, th by like, putting sensory input into your brain and then making you go out and do something or by directly actuating a machine. Um, and you know, Uber is a kind of poster child for the benefits of adversarial interoperability. So one of the, Uber has been one of the most aggressive companies at blocking adversarial interoperability, whether that's a thing to price comparison between multiple rideshare apps or apps that let drivers uh, improve the gains that they get by, by bet making better driver tools than the ones that Uber offers. Uber has been really aggressive at shutting those down and because it has lots of power, because it's so well funded, because we're in such an unequal world and because its investors are willing to give them so much money because they see the upside of, it, of blocking adversarial interoperability. They can buy policy outcomes where they can block this stuff and they can you know, ab uh, violate the uh, Americans with Disability Act and so on with impunity and regulators throw up their hands and say, we're powerless to stop them. They, they shut us down with their army of lobbyists every time we try. But what's really interesting is what happens when Uber fails to block competition. So the city of Austin has a rule that if you're a cab driver, you need to be fingerprinted and subjected to a criminal background check, for better or for worse. I, 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 I don't know, I think there's plenty of people who we've taken the fingerprints of and declared criminals who are probably not criminals. And that's, but, but whatever, that's the rule. So Austin said to Uber and Lyft, all of your drivers are cab drivers, make them get fingerprinted. And Uber and Lyft said, if we do this for you, all the cities are gonna want us to do it, so we're not gonna do it for you, we're leaving. Uh, good luck without any taxis in Austin now. And so what happened was the drivers who've been driving for Uber and Lyft formed a cooperative, paid some software developers to clone the Uber app. Uh, it's an app called Ride, uh, and it works as well as Uber and Lyft, and the drivers get 25% more money. And the, the other really important difference about them is that they don't have hundreds of millions of dollars in uh, investor money that they can use to send an army of lobbyists to the city if the city says, by the way, we're going to make you enforce the Americans with Disability Act or honor the Americans with Disability Act or we're gonna start taking giant chunks out of your hide. So for them, obeying the law is a lot more important than Uber. So, you know, the, again, like the problem with Uber is not that it's a tech company, it's obviously a tech company because, and the fact that it's in physical world doesn't make it not a tech company, they're all in the physical world. The problem is that it's like a huge monopolist that can buy whatever policy outcome it wants and that uh, they operate a two-sided market between drivers and riders in which they skim the cream uh, of both the drivers and the riders. And it turns out that you can replace Uber with a small shell script that you can bang up in six months. So, you know, give us the right regulatory environment and uh, everybody wins, except, you know, Travis Kalanick and Peter Thiel. Um, are there any people identify as women or non-binary? Yeah, go ahead. 
Um, kind of building off of that, so do you have any advice or hope for women or people of color who are starting tech companies and who have access to, if you're a woman, less than 2% of venture capital, if you're a person of color, less than 1% of venture capital, um, how to address those gaps, especially when a lot of these founders are not attracted to the VC model because they're not interested in maximizing shareholder value, they're trying to maximize purpose and mission. So I'd love to hear any bright spots. Yeah, uh, so Larry, Lawrence Lessig, he talks about the world being regulated by four forces. There's code, what's technologically possible, law, what's legally allowed, norms, what's socially acceptable, and markets, what, what's profitable. And I, I like to think of these as like, um, they're, they're, they're like directions that you might be able, to, that you can check to see whether you have any free play in that direction. So I moved to Los Angeles after having grown up in big cities and never having learned to parallel park because I never had a car. And now I have to parallel park all the time and I suck at it. And when I parallel park, I spend a lot of time backing and forwarding. And so when I backward and forward in my parallel park, I'm trying to create like another inch of space when I back up. And then I create another inch of space when I go forward. And then I create another, and so I'm like just, like is there just even an inch that I can move into? And when I think about code and law and norms and markets, I think about those as all being directions that you can move in where you might have an inch, right, that you can move into. So you want to start a business and you don't have access to venture capital. Is there like a normative frame that you can put that business in that might give you a competitive advantage over a venture backed one? Like, can you tell a story about how the business uh, is one that you should support because it's the kind of business that is excluded from venture capital but is responsive to the needs of people who venture capitalists don't give a shit about, right? Is there a regulatory story you can tell, you know, a legal story you can tell where there's a, like a discrimination, there's an obvious and blatant form of discrimination that you can seek legal redress for? Uh, is there a technical thing that you can do that they can't do uh, because they uh, doing something um, technical might undermine one of their margins, right? Like, so, you know, Apple doesn't want to make a phone with lots of app stores. They want to make a phone with one app store. Uh, so can you do something that they, that they, that's unthinkable for them? You know, there's a company called Cloudflare that did this thing today where they announced that they would sell domains, uh, top level domain or d uh, regular domains at cost. And so that's the thing that none of the people who actually sell domains could do because if they did that, then it would put them out of business. Now it's weird and anti-competitive, right? It, but it is going to like immediately put all of the um, domain sellers out of business because they can't make any money selling this at cost and Cloudflare sells other stuff and just having more domains in the world is good for them in the same way that like giving away a phone operating system was good for Google and it was this, this competitive move that they could make that uh, its rivals couldn't. So is there a technical thing that you can do that they can't do? Unfortunately, most of our technical avenues are blocked off by the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, and increasingly uh, high cost, high compliance cost regulations that, to address problems of, like legitimate problems of big tech. I, the reason I, I have that whole codicil around it is I don't want to sound like I'm opposed to all regulation, and I don't want to sound like I don't like, I don't think those are real problems. I just think that the, the devil's in the details. So. You know, I would, at a guess, I would say the normative pitch is kind of the area where you have the most wiggle room. And it's only going to take you so far, right? Like a normative pitch will only get you maybe an inch. But maybe when you traverse that inch, you will find that there's another direction you can move an inch in, right? Maybe having normatively created a business that's cash flow positive or in profit, that might attract non-traditional investors who are outside of the VCs and not at the level that the VCs are willing to put in, but maybe at a level that uh, will allow you to tell a more powerful normative story, uh, or maybe at a level that will uh, make you uh, an attractive candidate for uh, uh, impact litigation, where you can make the kind of technology that might attract a lawsuit from the big tech companies, but might, might also attract pro bono defense from a campaigning law firm that wants to see the law done away with, right? So, it's like it's not a it's not a roadmap, right? I don't know how to get from A to Z, but it's a heuristic. It's a it's a rule of thumb for like getting from A to B and then seeing which route might get you to C when you arrive at B. Thank you. Thanks, sir. So it seems like a, a solution for a lot of like problems with digital freedom is like um, an anti-monopolistic one, like getting rid um, whether it's like um, anti-monopoly uh, uh, laws or uh, reforming the uh, CFAA. But um, a, a problem with like, I feel like 
how do you deal with like when you have this shit like lots of uh, since we're living in an age where lots of like personal information uh, that people use on digital platforms like how do you deal with uh, I feel like structurally it's more easier to like when you have all your personal information with like Google or Apple or Facebook they have uh, a lot of money to spend on security teams whereas like with uh, people moving to Mastodon which is like an open source uh, Twitter alternative like um, you're uh, liable towards whatever your Mastodon host uh, yeah, is sure. and a lot of the dark messages are uh, they're protected by less of a security team right it's a it's a good question you know uh, but I think that there is the one of the cruxes of it is the belief that the problem with uh, data collection can be solved with with like vast data collection can be solved with enough technical nous right like if you have a big enough security budget and a and a, secu and a, a, a good enough team that um, you'll be able to stop that data from leaking I don't think that's true I think that it's that the that Google in small and big ways already has leaked a ton of information and will continue to as will Facebook as will the rest of them you know it, it there are it's like gathering a ton of data clearly does produce some really interesting product capabilities uh, I think they're often overstated right uh, but but still there's some that it, that it can produce but it's at a cost that comes a long way down the way and so we tend to like regulate it as though it doesn't come with any cost at all in the same way that like you know fossil fuels are like produce benefits that are undeniable although often overstated but the the cost is real but it's so far away that it's hard to like adequately regulate the way that we use fossil fuels so i think the right answer is to actually make data collection into uh, something that's so expensive or regulatorily burdensome that everybody does less of it right like it's it's true that you know Mastodon run, run by some rando is going to be less secure than Twitter, but it's a mistake to think that Twitter is itself secure. It's just more secure than Mastodon run by some rando. And like the thing that Twitter should do is, is not hold data on us. That's the best way to not leak data is to like not collect it and not retain it. Um, and again, like one of the big problems with deputizing tech companies to solve social problems is you incentivize them to retain data. Like how do you find, you know, if you have to stop harassers, how do you find harassers? Well, you look back through their history, right? You become like a little NSA that kind of can, you know, someone does something bad and you look back through all of their messages and all of their patterns and the IP addresses they came from and all this other stuff that like may in fact help you catch a harasser but may also reveal a whole bunch of other personally identifying compromising information about people and if it breaches you run into problems there and I'm not sure exactly how we get there I have some theories I think that one of the things that's not widely well understood about data breaches is that the um, risks are cumulative so if I breach a data set today that has nothing that can be used to attack you in it but someone breaches another data set tomorrow that can be merged with it like so say I breach a data set today of prescription information from the National Health Service in the United Kingdom uh, but it's all anonymized. There's no names associated with it. And then tomorrow, someone breaches uh, the data set of a uh, hire car service, uh, or you know, uh, um, Addison, Addison Wesley, or any of those those other those companies that you know, what are they called? The the big the big taxi companies there. If I breach that data set, and now I know who went to the hospital and then left again right before the prescription was done, now I can merge those two data sets. And one of the most stark ways that this shows up is um, with enough data sets pooled and intersected you can do things like forge duplicate deeds to people's houses right you can get you can like submit enough money enough data to a property register that they'll give you a deed to someone's house so around 2015 2016 there was a rash in New York and London at the peaks of the two markets of people selling other people's houses while they were out of town and like you just come home and your house has changed hands right so like we have the no win, no fee contingency law industry trying to figure out a way to, f to convince a court to capture all of that liability uh, when people have a breach. Because right now, like, the, the, the damages are ridiculous, right? Like, Home Depot breaches 80 million credit cards, and the damages are 60 cents per customer and a voucher for six months of free credit monitoring, right? What it should be is like 1% of the cumulative value of all of the property owned by everyone in that breach. 
right? The day that happens, every insurer and reinsurer writing an errors and emissions policy for that company and its board is gonna call up the board and say, tell me exactly what data you're storing, why you need to store it, uh, and, uh, and uh, we're gonna audit your full practices and your premiums are going up 50,000% effective tomorrow if we don't like the answers. Right? Like that might be one way we could, we could solve this problem. may not be the only way. Maybe we'll actually get regulation. Maybe the regulation could just be, here's the liability regime for breaching data, and then all the insurers take care of it. There are lots of ways that we could blend markets and law to, to make that work. And you know, norms have a role too. You know, I, I dream of the day when saying, come to my kid's birthday party, uh, find the details on Facebook, as as odious as, come to my kid's birthday party, it'll be held in a closed room and we'll all be chain smoking, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Did you want to ask a question? Yeah. Hi. Uh, so your story about the uh, group of uh, taxi drivers uh, in Austin that just hired someone to make their own app got me thinking there's the knowledge of how to code is there's much more people in the world that know how to code. They teach it in middle school and high school now. and. Um, and in addition to that, there's also uh, new movements towards like open source formats. And so uh, uh, I work um, as a biologist, and so uh, in the sciences, people you know use Mathematica or MATLAB, which are you pay a lot of money for. But now people are moving to Python. It's open source. You can anyone can build their widgets. And as we all gain a little bit of coding knowledge, we don't have to pay a company to do it for us anymore. Is there a hope that like as technology and the knowledge of how to code becomes more ubiquitous, is there a role for like an open source platform mm -hmm. in the social media domain? So we used to think about code in, as being either open or closed, right? Like so you have the stuff that anyone can open up and look at, improve, and uh, that is distributed in the preferred format for examination and improvement. And then you have the code that is designed to prevent that, to frustrate that end. That's much harder work to do it with. And that's the historic battle between open and closed, Microsoft and GNU Linux, say. But we have a new realm of stuff, which is the stuff that's a felony to figure out how to open up. And I think that you're, that you're right, like all other things being equal, like openness just makes sense. It, it's, it produces better code quality, it, produ it produces better economics, you know, like, just, you know, if, no, there are so many people who pay for code to do a thing, but they, they don't, re but they, they don't care about the code, they care about the thing, right? So the White House, under the last administration, had a Drupal-based uh, website. Uh, Drupal is a free and open platform for making websites, right? So uh, they paid, a, they paid, instead of paying to make to, to someone to, for a license for a website platform, they paid a hacker to improve Drupal, and because Drupal is open, everybody now gets to enjoy that. And it costs them less to pay that person to improve Drupal to suit the White House's needs than uh, it would have to license the code. And, and so they get the benefit of it, everyone else gets the benefit of it. The Onion is run on Drupal. The Onion gets to use the White House's improvements to improve the Onion, right? So this is this kind of virtuous cycle. All other things being equal, you get that. But if it's a felony to make a thing talk to another thing, if it's a felony to like open it up and, and make it work, a felony contented business model becomes a, like a, a common uh, uh, feature of our industry, then the frame for the fight that we've been fighting is, is the wrong frame. We have a totally new one, which is that like, not that it's hard to interoperate, but that it's illegal to interoperate. Um, one of the things about mere difficulty interoperating is sometimes like v investors want to give you money to crack the difficulty of interoperating, right? Like they're, they're, they're like, well, if you, yeah, they've got all these barriers and it'll cost X dollars to overcome the barriers, but the market you open when you do is worth two X dollars. That's a good bet for us. Here's some money, go hire some programmers, right? But if you go to those same investors and they say, yeah, it'll cost you X dollars to overcome the barrier, two X dollars available once you do, but, uh, it's illegal and they'll shut you down and they'll take all the money we give you, uh, then they won't give you any money. And so all of the things that we rely on for resource, goodwill of programmers, money from investors, willingness by institutions like universities to contribute, all of those things are contingent on it not being illegal to interoperate.
Thank you. Thanks. Hello. Um, so uh, when you were talking about um, how uh, regulations have the potential to uh, basically give the big tech companies an unlimited uh, license over the internet or uh, an exclusive license. Permanent internet domination license, per yeah. Yes, permanent internet domination license. So I was thinking about um, HIPAA. Um, which yeah. is something that tech companies have to comply with now. And you, you, what you see is you have a lot of um, third parties which deal with that compliance issue for you. And so the market kind of has a way, it's still a tax that you have to pay to be HIPAA compliant, but the market has come in and made it somewhat cheaper. So I was considering that model compared to what you were talking about, an alternative model of creating overlays on top of these proprietary services. And uh -huh. I, 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 wa I was wondering if you could maybe it, talk I more mean, about yeah. those overlays and how that, you know, those two approaches might compare. So I guess the difference is that um, it, the, the analogy with HIPAA would be more like if HIPAA said, in order to conduct a procedure, right, to, to, to do a CT scan, you need to go to um, a doctor who's got this qualification. And all of the doctors who had that qualification all worked for Providence or Kaiser or whatever, right? That, that um, the reason that tech was able to step in and do HIPAA compliance is because tech is a different industry from health. But what tech is being asked to do is regulate its, its, its own conduct. All the people who have the expertise to solve the problem that we're asking the platforms to solve work for the platform. Um, and you know, so you would have to outbid the platform for the labor to do the, to solve the problem in order to get there. So it's a, it's, a, it's a much less likely problem to solve. And one of the things that we've seen is that because tech has amassed so much capital, they're willing to do really big capital expenditures to wall themselves off from competition. Their capex of big tech went to $80 billion this year, doubled, I think, in the last year. Uh, like Facebook's laying their own fiber, transatlantic fiber, right? So normally, like that is exactly the kind of thing we talk about, right? Like you have, you, we need some glass under the sea, uh, and so someone who's really good at that gets a boat and gets a big spool of, of fiber and lays it down the sea bottom, and then everyone buys space on that fiber. Facebook's just going to own their own piece of fiber, and so if you want to compete with Facebook, you don't buy time on the same wire as Facebook, right? You have to like find a competitor that in an industry where all of the big players have stopped buying from third parties. So it's, it's, it's a really different world once you have this unequal distribution of capital and wealth. And also one of the ways that the capital and wealth plays out is access to policy levers. And so um, the rules for a third party uh, are likely to be rules that are harder for them to comply with than the rules that the, that the big platforms can. You know, a, a good example would be in the European Union all the big tech companies had a fiction that every transaction they completed was in Luxembourg. And that was because Luxembourg doesn't have sales tax. And so if you bought an ebook in London from Amazon, you didn't pay 20% VAT. But if you bought it from Waterstones, the national chain, you did. So obviously no one bought ebooks from Waterstones because they cost 20% more. So the European Union said, all right, uh, you have to um, start collecting sales tax. And the regime they came up with was one in which you have to um, collect two non-contradictory pieces of personal identifying information for each customer to identify their location, but it can't be their payment data, so it can't be their credit card. It has to be something else. And you have to retain it for 10 years. And uh, you have to calculate the VAT for the category of, of good that they're buying in each of the 28 member states. And you have to remit every quarter to each of the 28 member states if you collect as little as one cent and VAT from it, so with no minimum. So there, the, you know, I lived in London. I had a little business where I sold my eBooks online, and every quarter I was spending about 700 pounds in accountancy fees to remit 17 pounds in um, uh, VAT. But I could just sell through Amazon, and if I gave Amazon 30 percent of all of my revenue, they would do the bookkeeping for me. Now there are services that do the bookkeeping for me, but they cost almost 30 percent of my take home. So they're a little better than Amazon, but not much. So pretty limited. Thank you. <coughs> yes, ma'am. Um, first, I would like to, to say that I really, really would like to agree with you. OK. <laughs> um, uh, and y you think about giving power to little guys. Yes, it's great. But when you give them this 
technological tools, we end up with fake news on our hand and a president like this in White House. And, um, uh, and my example of this, we, for some reason we're talking about a lot about Facebook, um, Google, Twitter, but for some reason we are shy to talk about Amazon, and you just mentioned it. And um, it's, it's actually a platform that giving um, equal rights to anyone and uh, to any little person who could um, sell any little thing. And, uh, we are, and we all love it because we could buy cheap. But it's probably, from my point of view, it's most disruptive um, thing that uh, technology created. It's drived out all these businesses outside, all these local businesses, including publishing, for example, for our intellect, for us intellectuals, and a lot of publishing, my publishing was closed, and um, a lot of uh, local businesses, and um, uh, all these people who uh, lost jobs, they actually, these people, because of uh, there's lost jobs because of Amazon, these people actually voted for Trump because they hope for something, something that could be done in reality. So um, that's a um, new utopian dream with little guys having these tools. Yes, probably tomorrow they could, um, mm, mm, uh, anybody could, uh, uh, program anything, but who actually most, act, most active? Again, criminals. Again, people with these vicious ideas and with they, for some reason, they have much more uh, uh, freedom doing this because they don't have these ethical um, constraints that we have. So it's very hard to me to believe, uh, although I would love, I actually on your side 100%. Uh -huh. <laughs> so uh, one thing we know is that, um, w like one thing we know for sure is that uh, big tech didn't solve the problem of uh, fake news, right? <laughs> the way we know that is we have fake news and we have big tech. So uh, it's, it's not the case that big tech is the, um, is the answer to fake news. So it may be that eliminating big tech also won't eliminate fake news, but keeping big tech doesn't obviously get rid of fake news either. So it, it, uh, fake news is, is like, a pro disinformation is a problem. Uh, epistemological incoherence, right, which is like where, why disinformation works, where we, we no longer know which experts to trust and we, we are heuristics about who is and isn't a trustworthy source. That, that is a real problem, it's like why People believe in flat Earth and uh, Gwyneth Paltrow's ideas about about healthcare and um, you know uh, conspiracy theories about about you know uh, 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 creeping Sharia law or whatever, right? All of those things come spring from not just people telling lies, but the people they're telling lies to, not knowing how to determine which experts they trust and which ones they don't. That's it's a big terrible problem. Big tech probably supercharges it, but big tech I don't think created that problem. I think that. We've, there are lots of things that created that epistemological incoherence. Uh, um, some of which is that there are a bunch of things that were like obviously untrue that were part of the establishment line for a long time. Like the only way we can solve the financial crisis is to give a ton of money to the banks, and then they'll be good stewards of that money. And I think that you know, if you wanted to make people believe that experts are not to be trusted, that would be a really good way to start, right? Um, the reason fake news was able to spread on Facebook is that Facebook had a monolithic uh, algorithm for promoting information into people's uh, attention, into people's dashboards, right? There was like a system that could be parsed out, understood, it, it applied to everyone on Facebook, uh, and it meant that if you could, uh, if you spent the energy to figure out what it was that made Facebook, you know, uh, bubble up your stuff, you could make Facebook show it to lots and lots and lots of people. Um, and I don't think that, uh, you know, I think that, that the thing that Facebook did more than anything was not convince otherwise uh, sane people that crazy things were true. I think what Facebook did was made it possible to locate vulnerable people 
and show them untrue things, right? I don't think Facebook is a convincing system. I think it's a locating system, right? Um, you know, that's why we use Facebook, right? It finds your family. It finds people who have the same rare disease as you. It finds people who have heterodox political views. It finds people who went to high school with you. It finds people who have the same hobby as you. And it finds people who are willing to believe in creeping Sharia law, right? It, it finds people, it finds traits that are not widely dispersed in the population and allows people to reach them, including advertisers, including people who purvey fake news. One of the things that letting people create their own overlays to Facebook to, to change how information is bubbled up to you does is it allows you to preserve that function of finding people who share an interest with you, which is a really important function, but without subjecting yourself to Facebook's manipulation of the discourse that you undertake. Because Facebook has a, like a fundamental problem, which is that when you find people who went to high school with you, there's not a lot of news, right? You can check in on that once a day, briefly keep up with what's going on, and then log out again, right? There's no long-term engagement. It doesn't generate a lot of page views. There's not a lot of advertising revenue in um, helping people with a rare disease find other people with a rare disease because there's not much news about your rare disease on any given day. But so what Facebook has done is they've kind of A-B split their way to these engagement systems where they show you stuff that keeps you clicking and that is inevitably not relevant to the stuff that you went to Facebook for, right? They hijack your attention. If you could keep the part where you found your friends on Facebook, but didn't have to use Facebook's tools to converse with them, then you could, in fact, escape the mechanism that bubbled fake news up over your transom. That, you know, we could, we could fork the two functions of Facebook. I mean, there's a reason that Facebook's um, people finding tools are like total jetpack 21st century futurism and their message board tools look like the 1990s called and they want their bulletin board system back. It's because the messaging system is, is like it's only there to bait you so that you will identify your interests so that they can show you ads. But it's why you're there, right? You're not there to look at ads, you're there to message with people who share your poorly distributed difficult to locate interest. So I don't know if that was super coherent, but like I think that it's a, it's a category error to say the reason that we have fake news is that our tech isn't big enough, right? And therefore, it's a category error to say making tech smaller will solve fake news or make fake news, or, or won't solve face, fake news or will make fake news worse. I think we might be out of time. Do you have time yeah. for one more question? Sure, uh, sure. I'll make it quick. Sorry, okay. I know I ran. Oh, it's a really small question. Uh -huh. um, okay, so te technology thought leaders, uh, they have a really strong belief in the idea of singularity, like man and machine are going to morph uh, uh, yeah. in the next 30 years. Um, I mean, looking, looking at that perspective, um, what is the impact on democratic te technology, what you're talking on? Yeah. And as far as singularity is concerned, um, do you think it's inevitable? I think, like, as a science fiction writer, it's an adorable idea to write made-up stories with to help you pass the long slog, slog from the cradle to the grave, but don't mistake <laughs> it for a prediction. Um, I think that, like, every group finds its own transcendental myth. Like, like it's about, you know, the singularity is about the sloughing off of the flesh and the becoming immortal of your spirit, right? It's, you know, it's, it's not surprising that people have latched on to that belief. People latch onto that belief, you know, like we nuzzle for the breast, right? It just like, it seems to come to us naturally for some reason. Um, but I've never heard anyone like coherently explain what a person is, let alone what a person would be once they were in software. And so, you know, if you don't have a crisp problem definition, any uh, predictions about your ability to solve it are pure conjecture. Thank you. Thank you. All right. On that, um, maybe we thank, uh, thank uh, Jack and Corey. Thank you so much for coming. That was a real honor. Thank you.